Proverbs chapter 4 verses 3. The Bible says, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. And the Bible says, And he taught me also, and said unto me, Thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and leave. The father loves the son. The son is the beloved of the father. And the father, because he loves the son, he looks for what to teach this boy. And what he can teach Solomon is, let thine heart retain my words. There is no greater expression of love that a man can ever extend to you than to instruct you in the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. Than to point to the words of life. I'm not talking about these emotional things. You go, oh, Bambi, he loves me. He buys me chocolate. You know, I'm not talking about the love that buys you chocolate. Are you hearing me? I'm talking about a love, like the Bible says, that is of God. I'm talking about a love that expresses itself by speaking truth, revealing truth to you. Are you hearing me? The Bible says, speaking truth in love. The Bible says, we might grow into him in all things, which is the head of, of even Christ. We speak the truth in love. That we might grow into him in all things. That everybody that reveals truth to you, reveals love. Hallelujah. Because we are living in a very deceived, so to speak, dispensation, if I may say, of men who sometimes preach the gospel contrary to its revelation and truth. People cannot walk in the, the power of God. They cannot walk into the blessings of God. They cannot function in the inheritance given them because many people were deceived about how God works. But even though there is a lot of deception also, grace abounds for truth to come through. And you and I are living in a generation where truth has been availed. In fact, the scripture has never been most true as it is now or most powerful as it is now when the Bible says, though he be not far, he has made of all nations, of all blood, of all nations, that they might seek after him. The Bible says, if might happily they might feel after him, if happily they might find him. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, they should seek after him, if happily they might feel after him and find him. And the Bible says, though he be not far from every one of us. God is not far from you. Some man sang and said, Lord, you seem so far away. I understand why he sang that song. You understand? He, I understand, and I don't blame him for feeling that God was far away. But it doesn't matter how much far you feel God is. You are actually the one who is far. God is not far from you. Somebody say amen. Sometimes when you don't feel him, it doesn't mean that he's not there. No, you're the one who is not there. Uh-huh. Can I go deeper? The Bible says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. The Greek word therefore abide is if you stay present to me. You know, there are people who attend service, but they are absent from the Lord. There are people who are praying, but they are absent from the Lord. There are people who are fasting, but they are absent from the Lord. There are people who are worshipping God, but they are absent from Him. He says, if you be present to me. And my words are present to you. You shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Sometimes it's more than just attending service. It's being present to God. It's him knowing that you are present to me. And tonight I'm going to show you how. I'm going to explain what it means to be present before God. Somebody say amen. So, he can be so near but you're absent. You remember like when you used to be in class? In our, back in our school, for those of you who have gone to school and I'm sure all of you have. There were always children who were always absent-minded. <laughs> Me, I was always attentive. <laughs> what? As a good boy. Listening to the teacher. Whatever the teacher would say, I was always attentive. 
because I loved to be attentive. Even when I was a baby, I was always attentive. But there were people, and I'll not mention your names, but when I look at your faces, I can tell. The teacher is teaching and their eyes are looking who? You understand? You come back and sit. You they pull the kid down. No, no, sit down. There are people who are like that. Right? Did I mean that the person did not attend class? They did attend class. But their mind was not present. Somebody said absent. <laughs> I wonder whether they are present. You understand? <laughs> Do you get what I'm trying to say? So, God is not far from you. The anointing is not far from you. Glory is not far from you. Breakthrough is not far from you. Miracles are not far from you. Signs and wonders are not far from you. They are not far from you. You are the one who is sometimes far from them. Praise the Lord Jesus. That is why the ministry of the gospel is to draw you. Not, you understand what I'm saying? To draw you to him. Praise the Lord. Now, this is Solomon speaking about his relationship with his father. And he said, my father loved me. That's the revelation of love. It's like recently, the Holy Spirit was ministering to me about the mystery of love in its entirety. Do you, okay, many of you don't know, but let me, let me help you understand. Do you know that, of course, this is now general, but I'll share a few things that many of you didn't know. It's general that the healing arm of God is the expression of his love. You understand what I'm saying? God heals the sick, for example, to tell them, I love you. You understand what I'm saying? If it is true that God heals or does miracles in the lives of people to prove to them that he loves them, no man can be disqualified from the miraculous. Because he doesn't love men on condition. He loves them unconditionally. How many of you understand what I'm saying? If you find a person, uh, recently, uh, sometime I was dealing with somebody, who was praying for somebody and told him, you know why you're not getting healed? You're not born again. You have to be born again so you get healed. Then they force someone and say, okay, okay, I'm ready to get born again. Why are they they pushing them to get born again? Because that's the only way they will convince them that they will be healed after being born again. When we go for crusades of sin, the people who get salvation and healing are not born again people. They are not born again people. Many of them, of course Christians to receive healing because healing is a children's bread. But not everybody we pray for and is healed is healed because they are born again. Some people are not honestly born again. But because they are not born again, they mean that God cannot flood his love on them. God loves us. He loves everybody. That is why he gives rain and bread to the heathen. Do you agree? Because he has to prove to you and I that I love you regardless. They have an opportunity to accept him as their Lord and Savior and take that extending arm. Or they have the choice to say, I don't need your love. But he will extend it. Are you following what I'm saying? He will extend it. If love is expressed in healing, right? Revelation, revelation is the true distinctive mark of that love that is expressed. You understand? Because revelation is actually God's redemptive power. Revelation is defined as God's redemptive power. Every time revelation comes to you, understand that there is a redemptive work that God wants to express in you. The most distinct mark of the love of God is to give you revelation. Oh, oh, do you understand what I'm saying? Not to give you a car, a house, no, 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 it's to give you revelation. Because whether you are receiving healing and you're not a believer, it's still the revelation of the man delivering that healing to you that gets you that healing. The miraculous is the aftermath of that revelation. Of the redemptive power of God. When the power of God is revealed, when, when the power of God is, is expressed, the miraculous take place. 
Re- revelation, therefore, is not just things that come to your head for you to say, ah, wow, this is so deep. No, no, no. In everything the Lord places in your heart and in your spirit, always look back to say, where is the revelation of this? And once revelation hits your spirit, scream in your heart with the understanding that something in me has been redeemed. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> that is why if you go in the Amplified Bible, many parts where the revelation is put, the word revelation, right? It is translated as God's redemptive power. Praise the Lord. Some parts he puts re- revelation and he puts God's redemptive power. Revelation is in your life to redeem you. Somebody say amen. And by expression of that love, the healing, the miraculous, and all these things take place. So, there is no man who is not a candidate of the power of God. You understand? No, no. You read the Gospels. The Bible tells us Jesus went about doing good and healing all of them that were oppressed of the devil. Were all of them righteous? Did he say, and Jesus went about healing all the righteous which were oppressed of the devil? No. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He did not give a distinction of the Jew and the Gentile, the slave, the free, the bond, and the liberated one. No, 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 no. Whether there were sinners or not everywhere, he went, he went doing good. He went healing the sick. It is God's part to deliver, to bring the salvation to them. But regardless, a man should never be cut short because he does not believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, for you, you believe. Extend that power to him. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, when, when, when Solomon says, my father loved me, and he taught me to retain the words, his words, or his words, the Hebrew word there for word is dabar. The Hebrew doesn't draw distinctions in the word of God. Wherever you find the word word, it will be dabar. Or actually, in the true pronunciation, dabar. Even though it's written as D-B-A-A-R, D-A-B-A-R, it's, tr- it's, it's, pronounced as davar, right? It means the word of God. Simply the word of God. But when we get to the New Testament, the word of God is defined in two ways. There are two definitions of the word of God. Okay? And one is logos, and the other one is rema. Now, of course, many of you know, I fear here people say, ah, yes, I know, logos, logos is the word of God, rema is the spoken word. But as I'm going to share tonight, Many of us are going to appreciate that we did not quite understand the depth of these two words. Praise the Lord. Let's begin with Logos. Logos is the expression of the thought of God. Okay? It is the expression of thought. It reveals the mind of Jehovah God. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, people say, oh, Logos is a a total sum of the word of God. Yes, that's true. But in which sense? In the sense that it expresses the thought of God. It expresses the mind of God. It expresses how God thinks. Are you following me? The mind, the total sum of the mind of God. And it is expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says he spoke in sundress at times and diverse manners to the prophets. The Bible says how God at sundry times and diverse manners spake in past unto the fathers by the prophets. And the next verse says, but he hath in this last day spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also are the worlds framed. Now, Logos is expressed through the person of Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 1. In the beginning was Logos, and Logos was with God, and Logos was God. The same was in the beginning, Logos, with God. All things were made by Logos. Without him was not anything made. When you go to verses 14, John chapter 1, verses 14, And Logos was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That means Logos which is the expression of the thought of God, was manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus walked the surface of this earth as the manifestation 
of the expression of the mind of God. When you saw Jesus, you understand how God thinks. You understand what I'm saying? Everything Jesus did revealed the thoughts of the Father. Everything Jesus said reveals the thoughts of the Father. Are you following me? Are we together at that level? So, when you received Jesus, what did you receive? Oh, when you received Jesus, what did you receive? How can you say, I don't know what God thinks? How can you say, I don't know what God thinks about this? No, 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 no. When you received Jesus, what did you receive? Because Logos is personified in Jesus. He takes on the person of Jesus. That is why if you're studying the language there, Greek, you realize the word used there is Logos. And Logos was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He needed to access the world by his word. And he could only access it through the person of Jesus. Through a body. Because the Bible says every seed requires a what? A body. And what does Luke 8, 11 say? The parable is that the seed is the word of God. Every word requires a body. A word cannot carry existence without a body. Jesus had to come in a body to have function on the earth. Words are useless if they don't have a body attached to them. They can flow in the air, but if they don't have a body attached to them, they're useless. That is why he says, and the word that I send out, it shall not come back to me void. Did I send it in trees? Hello? Because the effectual working of that word has to be in a body. Otherwise, without the body, you carry no access and relevance to the earthly realm. That is why Satan needed to enter the body of a serpent. Because without that body, he could not tempt Eve. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you say, and then demons were speaking to me. You are the body they are using to speak to you. No demon of its own can speak without the relevance of a body. Oh, but how come I hear things speaking? No. It's your... Because they have contact with your body. There's a reason why somebody might not hear them. It's because they, they don't have access to his body. But when a demon has access to your body, you'll hear it speaking. Do you understand what I'm saying? Satan was not foolish to come in a serpent's form. No. He needed to carry a certain form to communicate to man, to tempt man, to mislead man. Without that form, he had no access. You are on the earth Making sense on the earth because you carry a body. You interact with the spirit realm because you carry a body. The moment you leave this body, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You can't just stay like a spirit moving on the face of the earth. My body is there, even me, I'm here. And then you just walk, you know. Like when people die, people say, we know that he is here with us. What do they mean? Do they mean that he is here in the sense that his spirit is just roaming and the body is down? And No, 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 no. Or probably if you're saying maybe the guy, in the sense you're saying that maybe his spirit is conscious to the activities of the abyss of the earth, right? That's understandable. Okay, of course there are people who say, uh, for example, when we become born again, you and I know, huh? you and I know that... The first man was of the earth, as he, right? And the first man was natural. He was not spiritual. How many of you agree? He was not spiritual. He was natural. He says, how be that was not first, which is spiritual, but which is natural, and afterward, which is spiritual. When he speaks of the first man, the first man was not spiritual. He was a natural man. The Bible says in Genesis, and God breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Are you hearing me? And Jesus was a life-giving spirit. You get the difference? Follow me here, don't lose me. Jesus was a life-giving what? Spirit. He was a life-giving spirit. But the first man, Adam, became a living soul. He was an individual personality. He had every affair of dealing with the divine from the soulish realm. And he said, ah, but there are people who 
who teleport, who do what. Let me explain what happens. Familiar spirits come in contact with their consciousness, with their souls. You get it? And because these familiar spirits give these souls consciousness, there is a deception that all of those people have spirits which are alive. No. The Bible is true. Let every man be a liar. But because every time they access that, they have a false reality of truth. You cannot go beyond the teaching and truth of the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? They must use some sort of familiar spirit for their soul to activate and access the spirit realm a certain way. But for you, you are born again. You're not born of flesh and blood, but you are born of God. He that is joined with the Lord, the Bible says, is one spirit with the Lord. How many of you have read the, the literal translation of that scripture? He that is joined with and to the Lord is one spirit. He that is, do you know the word they are tra- translated is haste, meaning one of the same. One of the same. God, woo-wee! It's, it's one of the same. With no exception of another. That, that, God doesn't look at you here and then himself here. No. He looks at you and him one. And Musumba. No, you see. Some of you find it to be robbery. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. You are one with the Lord. That's the grace of salvation. You are one with him. Some, you know, that's why I understand why certain people had problems with Paul. How can he write such a statement? How can you write such a statement and exist? I mean, these guys who are religious. He says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He's of one entity. One entity. With no exception, no comparison with another. In other words, you're not here and God is here. No, you and God are one. That they might be in me and I in you, that we might be one. That the world, the world will believe. Jesus is praying the same way in John 17. He says that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The only way the world can believe that Jesus was sent on the face of the earth is when we carry the oneness with the Father. If we don't carry that oneness, men cannot believe that Jesus was sent. Can you believe that the testimony of the coming of Christ is qualified in our oneness with the Father? Think about it for a moment. That what qualifies that Jesus came on the face of the earth is our oneness with the Father. If you doubt that oneness, you cannot prove that Jesus came on the earth. Or you do not believe that he was sent. But any man that believes that Jesus was sent understands the paradox of him in us and us in him. Hallelujah. You are in Christ. Christ is in the Father. Are you hearing me? When the devil looks from afar, what does he see? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, do you realize why disease has to fear you? Because when it comes to attack, they'll go, oh, don't attack the Father. Because the Son, you and I, are in the Father. Oh, there are people who are teaching certain doctrines that they are one with God, that they are one with God. Separate yourself. You see, the problem with them is they don't appreciate that we understand that mind in the sense that that they mean that we don't recognize Christ as the head. He is the head of the body. But this is Christ's body. And his body is him. Somebody shout hallelujah. His body is him. Everything that happens to you, happens to Jesus. Carry that consciousness. Carry that consciousness. Now, carry, just carry it. You might not understand it, but start to meditate it. That if, that's why when we're healing the sick, when we're healing the sick, we don't go as I, John Paul, 
mutashunga. I rip no no. Even when you say I, are you hearing me? It comes with a representation of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! That's logos. Have you understood it? It's the sum of God's mind. Whatever he has uttered as a revelation of his mind is logos. That is why I tell people, you can never deeply walk with God until you have the revelation of logos. Not just logos, but the revelation of logos. The revelation of his mind. Many decisions are around how God thinks. Many issues are judged around how God thinks. Many of them. When he found Moses stammering, you think he didn't have power to heal his mouth and then Moses would go and speak? No. He could have if he wanted. But he chose to put the words of Moses on Aaron for a purpose, a bigger purpose. That the mind of Christ will be revealed. That's the power of seeing light in his light. You understand the scripture? That we might find light in thine light. That is, that is the power of, of, of understanding the mind of God. He says, for with thee is the fountain of life. And in thine light, he says, we shall see light. That means in the illumination you give us, in there we shall see light. So Aaron walks with Moses. Let me just give you an example. Aaron walks with Moses. A man with less understanding will think, hmm, why didn't he make this guy speak? Because there's a bigger light that he wants to introduce by that purpose. Are you following me? And here it is. You realize that when God is giving Moses the three signs, you remember the signs? One of them is, he tells him, cast down your rod. And when he casts down the rod, what did that rod become? A serpent. You remember that? And then they walk to Pharaoh. And Aaron, the Bible says, shall be thy mouthpiece. He says, for I have put your words in Aaron. So Aaron used to speak the mind of Moses. Aaron used to speak the mind of Moses. Because that's what the scriptures say. That your words, I have put your words in Aaron. That means every time Aaron spoke, he spoke the mind of Moses. They started, right? Now, they go before Pharaoh. And when they stand before Pharaoh, many people assume that at that particular point, the trick was Moses' rod that was cast down again. But if you read the scripture, the scripture says it was Aaron's rod that was cast down. The rod of Moses, which was but for a sign that I was sending you. You see, woo, the sign, eh? the things that the Lord will reveal to you when he's aligning you to a particular course of destiny, the anointing, by which he functions to reveal to you the milestones of your destiny is different from the anointing which you need in the vindication of the office and the call of God upon your life. Moses, this speak and rod was different from the one that fell before Pharaoh that day. The Bible says that Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so as the Lord had commanded them. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. And the next verse says, and then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers now, the magicians, and they also did in like manner with the enchantments. And for they cast down every man his rod and they became servants, but Aaron's rod swallowed them all. And after that it became a rod. What was for a sign for Moses to believe God? It was different from Aaron's case. And then you realize again, that same road is the same road that buds. You remember? And all the roads are removed except that one is kept in the presence of Almighty God. You get my point? You realize that every time you read the story of Moses and Aaron, any business that engaged judgment outside from without was Moses. 
Any business that engaged judgment from within was error. The rod that buds was within. It was placed within. The, the rod that becomes a serpent, it was placed within. You understand what I'm saying? But any business that goes out to separate water, sending plagues, you realize it's the ministration of Moses. If Moses is the ministration of the law, he is the schoolmaster that leads you into the sheepfold. Aaron then is the ministration of grace. How do I know that? Because his rod budded without the physical ability of it to bud. That's unmerited favor. It was a dry stick. You understand what I'm saying? It did not appeal itself to the elements of germination. There wasn't soil, smaya, uh, 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 sunlight, water, and air, right? He wasn't there. But the next day, the man's road, road what? But God is trying to tell you, Aaron is a representation of something deeper. There's a reason why Moses cannot speak. Because the law cannot speak. Grace can speak. So, when in the light of Moses' stammering, we see the light of Aaron representing grace. You see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? But the simple man would say, why didn't he just, why didn't he just make the guy talk? Because he wanted you to see a certain light. When, listen, one time I made a statement, and I'm going to repeat it here before you. When a man is a man of God, not guys who look like they're men of God or who assume they are. I'm a pastor, I'm a man of, man of God, man of God. No, no, I'm not talking about people who call themselves men of God. They are signs of a man of God. You understand? And let me explain probably one or two or three of them for your understanding. Every man of God, every man of God, the person called man of God, eh, has been dealt with by God himself. It is more than getting slain. You understand what I'm saying? They carry a very defined mandate on their life. A very defined mandate on their life. There is a course the Lord has set on their lives. They don't just live like many people do. You understand what I'm saying? You can tell when you really meet a man of God. They cannot do anything against the truth but for the truth. Against. A man of God cannot set himself against truth. Cannot. He can make mistakes, but he can't set himself against truth. You get the difference? He can lie and know it's wrong, but he can't lie and qualify his lie and make it appear to be true. That is not a man of God. That is not a man of God. When you find a man of God, when you meet a man of God, or a true woman of God, you realize that every pattern of his life is a sermon. Eh? It's an instruction. You understand what I'm saying? It's an instruction. There was nothing Jesus did that cannot teach you. Even the slightest miracle was an instruction. He just didn't heal. Like I see some guys say, can I just heal? I show off and then someone heals by showing off. No. Jesus was not in the business of just healing to please men. He healed to teach you and I. Are you hearing me? Everything that Christ did. Now, you look at a man like in the, 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 the book of Ecclesiastes. Hmm? The guy woke up one day. Hmm? And then he drank wine, amassed gold, you understand, got himself maidens. He did many things. Eh? You remember the guy of Ecclesiastes? And, and the Bible says, he did everything. He was great in Christ more than all before Jerusalem. He's everything, right? But the Bible says, amazingly, because he was a man of God, the Bible says, his wisdom stayed his wisdom stayed. Regardless, the, he still carried the wisdom of God. And that's the wisdom that causes him to understand that all of this was vanity and vexation of spirit. For you to read the Ecclesiastes and not need to do all he did to get to the end of vanity. He, he did all these mistakes. For you, when you come and read Ecclesiastes, you don't need to waste your time to go through everything he went through. 
Because the wisdom he needed was the discernment to tell the difference that this is for profit and this is vanity. And in the end of all that man's mistakes, he understands the wisdom. He has the wisdom to discern between vanity and vexation of spirit and what is true and godly. You understand? For you to come through and read in his wisdom so you don't live the life he lived. You understand what I'm saying? But that when you get to the end of what is vexation and vanity, you believe him because he carried his wisdom. Now, even in his mistakes, he taught you. Because he was a man of God. He tells Peter, I see Satan sift you. You remember? He says, but I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith fail you not. He didn't pray for him. He had the power to say, Mukama, whatever is attacking Peter, I counsel. He didn't counsel the attacks of Peter. No. He prayed for Peter that his faith fail him not. Because in the falling of Peter, there was a light. Oh, you don't get it. Peter is a representation of church. He says, on this rock shall I build my church and the gates of hell shall not what? They shall not prevail. They shall not prevail. He's trying to give you the bigger light here. The bigger light here is that regardless of what the church goes through, regardless of what you have gone through, regardless of the mistakes that you make, regardless of how many errors you've made, don't lose faith. Don't lose your faith in God. Don't stop to believe in Jesus Christ. That is the reason why the world is judged. He says he shall judge the world of sin because it believed not on him. He's trying to tell you that your guarantee to go in heaven is not your works. Are you saying that works are useless? I'm not saying that works are useless. But they can be if you don't have faith. You understand what I'm saying? Our faith precedes our works. Works don't qualify our faith. Our faith qualifies our works. You understand what I'm saying? Least our works become dead works. Because they are not to the application of the working of the word of God in our spirits, but they are to our strength and ability, which is filthy to God. It's useless to God for you to think that you can always be the best. You can't in your own strength. Even if you are at your best, if it's still in your own strength, it is still folly. It's foolishness. You understand what I'm saying? It's foolishness. It's useless. That is why we don't boast when I, if I don't steal, I don't come and say, you see, me, I don't steal. No. If somebody asks me, why didn't you steal? I simply tell them, no. The one in me cannot steal. You, you get my point? The one in me cannot steal. So you have no boasting in the flesh. Where is that in boasting? Saving faith. That's what the Bible says. Where is thine boasting? In works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith, you are allowed to boast in faith. You are allowed to speak everything there is in the world if you're sure that this is the working of God in you because you have believed on him. But any time you go out of the things that he's doing through you to the abilities that qualify you as an individual without his word working in you by faith, then it's useless. Are you following? But even in Peter's fall, there was a light that the Lord wanted to shine on you to give you revelation. Peter's fall was your redemption. Oh, you didn't get it. In Peter's fall, there was a redemption for you. Are you following me, child of God? Are you following me, child of God? Rema. Have you understood Logos? Now, Rema is that which is spoken, which is uttered in speech or writing. The now word. Why is it spoken, written, or uttered at that particular point? It is because it is reconciled to Logos. At the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word is established. You understand what I'm saying? This establishment begins when, for example, if I say, be healed. It must be a conviction 
that has been aligned according to the revelation in Logos. You get my point? Eh? It's the now word, because it is the word, it is the spoken, it is the written, it is the uttered now word, because it, it seeks to reconcile Logos to that particular situation. You understand what I'm saying? It, it is the mind of God that by his stripes you were healed. It's in the Bible, First Peter 2.24. But it has no effect until when somebody is sick and somebody says, by his stripes I was healed. When you speak it according to the revelation of his mind in 1 Peter 2, 24, that becomes Rema. Now, I made a statement on Sunday that I'm going to build on and make you understand that many of you don't know how to work Rema. Not all Rema is divine. Not all Rema is divine. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36. Not all rema is divine. He says, I say unto you that every idol rema that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Did you hear that? Every idol rema that you speak, you shall give account to God on the day of judgment. Now let me show you a mystery. The word there for account is actually logos. You check the Greek word for account there, it's logos. Not just accounting, like a give me accountability. No. The word actually there for shall give account. The word there for account is logos. So it sounds like I say to you that every idle word that or every idle rema that men shall speak. They shall give logos thereof in the day of judgment. The word there for judgment is crisis. K R I S I S I. That's crisis. That's the Greek word crisis. Trouble. When you're in, in, in distress, when you're in attacks, you understand it? You're, you've, 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 you've been um, attacked or you're in a serious problem or some circumstances are, have come or, you, 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 or probably the, the doctors told you you have cancer or, or, or they've told you that so, so and so has died or they've told you that your business is down or your house has gotten burned or you don't have a job anymore or I want, and your man slides divorce papers under the door. That kind of crisis. You understand? He says, when crisis comes, when crisis comes, when crisis comes, his, remember the word idol means non-performing, useless, inactive, inoperative, without results. Are you following? So he says, every idol word that men shall speak, they shall give account. The word they are for giving account or giving is that they shall yield to reconcile it against Logos in that day of crisis. This is what God is trying to say. Every time you get into trouble, a situation hits you. The, the eyes of God open to look at you at how you respond to it. Every time trouble comes, eh? God doesn't get shocked at cancer. No. Wait, you have cancer. His mind gets on you right now to see. Let me see what you're going to do. He doesn't run to the side of, oh my God, my daughter has cancer. No. When they fire you, you're fired. God doesn't go, God doesn't, you don't faint with you. Oh, you didn't get it. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. You understand what I'm saying? His eyes are aligned on knowledge. They don't look at problems. They don't look at situations. You remember when Hagar was, was crying? She puts a boy afar off. Because they want to see her son crying. She starts crying. And, and the angel comes to Hagar and tells her, Ah, stop crying. For the Lord has had the tears of the lad. E even if you cry, you're not a seed of faith. You didn't understand what I just said. Ishmael was a son of Abraham. Abraham is a representation of faith. Cry all you want. I'm looking at where faith is. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Are you following me? Now, you see, some of you think that when you get a problem, for example, in the Bible, of course, many of you read the scriptures that he's with those that mourn. But why is he with them? That he mourns with them in their ignorance? No. That he gives them understanding. That he gives them knowledge. 
He sends his word and heals their disease. He doesn't want to cry with you until you die. Oh, okay, let's die together. <laughs> Jesus is with me. No. When, they, when you got the news and they say, I want a divorce. God didn't look at those divorces. It didn't shock him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he didn't live in your time series. He saw it coming. Everything you've gone through, he saw it coming. So don't think it has shocked God. No, no, no. No. He saw it coming. He saw it coming. Think about it. He saw it coming. The eyes of knowledge saw it coming. Now, when some happens in your life, the moment some happens in your life, God turns his eyes on you and is waiting for the next word that comes out of you to reconcile it with his mind. To see whether that word is yielded to Logos or not. If it is yielded to Logos, you shall be saved in the day of crisis. Oh, you didn't get what I just said. Your first response to a thing spells what you know about God. Hallelujah. Your first response on a thing spells what you know about God. Your first response. That's where idle words come from. Inoperative. Things that don't work. Now, I used to work in uh, health centers. I worked in hospitals before, so I know. And there was one of those times I, of course, did trainings in reproductive health, what, uh, many of those things, because I, part of my studies were, I did part of social work and administration. So part of my social work, of course, I used to go to hospitals, I did, you know, many things. I, like I told you, reproductive health, uh, and uh, antenato, I understand those things, immunization, everything, you understand, I know that area, that area very well. And one of those areas I think I was given an opportunity to practice then was voluntary counseling and testing, VCT. Right? So we used to put people in rooms, you, some of you have been there, where they start now counseling you, they start telling you what HIV is, and then they narrate facts. And then, after that, what do you do if you phone? Eh, you know, things. So we used to check people, right? So they find, you know, they find HIV in a person's blood. And so you tell this person, um, we've checked your blood and we've found HIV. At that immediate moment, somebody says, I'm dead. <laughs> did you hear that word? Did, did you just hear that word? Did you just hear that word? You understand what I'm saying? Eh? You have HIV. God, God didn't even shake on that. He turned to see the individual. And that's this. I'm dead. That's an idle word. That's costly. As I say, but I've prayed, I'm not getting healed. I'll tell you why you're not getting healed. The day of crisis, you fainted. That's what they call fainting in your day of adversity. He says, if you faint in your day of adversity, Thy strength is small. What does the message Bible say? He says, if you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. You were lying. You were not born again. You were playing church. Come on. You know, some of you know how to act like you're Christians. I'm born again. I love God. You understand? And then you tell them, this has happened. Then somebody, no. There was nothing to you in the first place. You are just acting movies. You are, you are just acting movies. That is the point where Rema is necessary. At that particular point, Ephesians 6, 17, it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Rema of God. Are you hearing me? It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Rema of God. It is the Rema of God. That, I told people, you remember, I, I had very serious heart issues. The Lord is my witness. This woman checks my heart. She says, oh, you're not going to go out. We can't even allow you to go out. This heart cannot live even for five months. It can't. The, the woman who checked me started shaking. She says, nurse, doctor, come on. This is too bad. You understand what I'm saying? Then they took me in her name. It's like that cut test, some machine. And then even the woman who put her, the metal on my heart, says, oh, the, the Chinese woman, she says, oh, this is so bad. He's going to die any time. Then almost 
the flesh almost kicked in. Almost. When I heard that news, I waited for that report. I went and put it on the table of the lady. She says, oh my goodness, I think we must, uh, we, we must, we must admit you now. This, this is so bad. This is so bad. I looked at the woman like this. Crisis. Crisis. They're telling my heart can't live for five months. Crisis. I looked at her, I started laughing. It began like a fake laugh. I said, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, Man, the gospel. At that point, I knew if I don't laugh, I'm going to die. I started laughing. I stood up and looked at the woman. I told her I'm late for work. So she asked me, oh, 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 scared for my life, what are you going to do? I told her I'll preach it out. How simply preach it out. I asked her, are you born again? She said, I'm born again. And I'm like, and you're that scared for me? I'm the one who's supposed to be scared about my state. But you are that scared for me. I told her I'm going to preach it out. Oh, it's many years now. And I play basketball every Saturday. Four hours non-stop. And, and the report was five months. You guys, eh? How you respond in the day of crisis determines your next step. Learn to laugh at situations. So he says, the moment you apply Rema, you are literally on the offense. In the spirit. Are you hearing me? The shield of faith. The sword of the spirit. That means, if the word of God is a sword, it's not drawn until you release a certain word in the spirit. Are you hearing me? The Bible is very clear. That's when the sword of the spirit comes out and starts to attack any situation. What you say at that particular point determines whether it's going to be sliced or not. It determines whether something... Kill it at the, kill it at the onset. But it has to get to a point where it lives here. I've realized that the gospel is a, you have to get mad. You have to get mad. Some of you, you're too sober to believe. Somebody shout hallelujah. Some of you are so sober. It's too sober to believe. You're too logical to believe. You're too reasonable to believe. That is why some of you die. Because everything, you reason everything out. You reason every, you apply logic to everything and emotion. Then you start dying slowly. Why? Because you think everything, you, you start applying. E man, man, fill yourself with the word of God. Hallelujah. The change might not come overnight. There were times after that I would wake up and one time I remember after that I was walking on the streets. Boom! The thing hits me. And then a voice starts saying, Aha! The doctor told you. <laughs> Are you hearing me? I was around Chikubo there. And then out of the blue, without even saying anything, I just found myself running and saying, The doctor said nothing! The Jesus said... I said, The doctor said nothing! The doctor said nothing! The Jesus... I Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You have to get to a point where you also When they say there is a casting down, you say there is a rising up. I said, devil, what do you mean? What do you mean the doctor said? I said, the doctor said nothing. The doctor said nothing. I started running. The pain was there. The sweating was there. I was feeling dizzy. But in my own dizziness, I was...
But some of you, immediately late. Then you do that. You first sit down a bit to breathe. What does the Bible say? He doesn't say, in all things we are more than conquerors. No. He, no, no. He doesn't say, in all things we are more than conquerors. No, no, no. He first brought a word called nay. That was Rema. He says, nay! As if he refused it. Are you hearing me? He says, no! Cancer was coming. And he says, nay! But in all things we are more than conquerors. Weakness was coming. He says, nay! But in all things we are more than conquerors. Trouble was coming. He says, ah! I'll teach about it soon. This one, Romans 8.37. Learn to say no. Tell somebody, learn to say no. and he gave it a comma, nay, comma in all these things some of you doctors speak and you're quiet no, don't keep quiet situations speak and you're quiet circumstances attack you and all you do is just watch oh okay, oh dear this is bad, no nay nay Nay. No, no. I will teach about this. Maybe you need to understand where he came from. Read the verse before 36. You read it. He says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. No, probably go a bit up. Let me see. Uh Aha. I will teach about it soon. He says, you shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation, distress, why are you saying no? The same reason why Paul said nay. He says, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, Haters, persecutors, losing jobs, divorce papers. Listen to this one. Rain. He says, nay, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors. No. I'm more than a conqueror. I don't care what you're going through. When it looks at you, it knows that you are more than a conqueror. God is looking for that woman who will wake up in the morning and feel a pain in her back when she feels says, Nay! Rakatabosha! Rakate! You look at the business and it's going down. And you say, uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh-uh. uh. You, you see empty chairs and you say, uh uh-uh. uh. That doesn't take away who called me. It doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change what is on me. Your car runs out of fuel. You pack it and say nay. In all these things. 
I am more than a conqueror. And then God realizes you have agreed with his mind. That is what they call walking together with the Lord. For two cannot walk together except they agree. That is the point where your mind, your words agree with the word of God. When they agree, that is the man or woman whom they say that woman has walked with the Lord. Did you understand what I just said? That is how you know that somebody has walked with God. When their Rema reconciles with his logos. What Jesus didn't say. I don't care whether it's in your life a thousand times. Don't say it. That's idol. That's idol. I can't say I am sick. I can't. I can't. I can't say that I am sick. I can look for another word to say it. But not that I am. I can't. Even if I don't have money in my pocket, I can't sound broke. If you're looking for it, you're not going to find it in Lubega Grace Matovu. You can't. You can find it in some people here. I can't say I have failed. If and if I try, I can't say I have. I can't. Somehow my tongue finds another way. I find myself proclaiming victory. But the communication of my faith will become effectual through the acknowledging of every good thing which is in me, which is in Christ. That it is firstly in me. Even if I'm got an offside and I say, Oh my God, oh my God. The next word that will come out. It shouldn't and can't be idle. Praise the Lord Jesus. Tell somebody, avoid idle talk. I've realized that some of you people, I've realized, some of you, you have learned the habit of joking. You say, ha, I was joking. Even in the joke, don't joke poor. Joke rich. Tell somebody, don't joke poor. Don't joke sick. Don't. Even in jokes. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in what? I don't joke a certain way. I don't joke a certain way. I don't joke a certain way. Because Logos holds me accountable. says if any of you should love a good life if you love life nga you here nga you love life the bible says you should what refrain your tongue from speaking evil if you love life if you love life give me the amplified of that he says for he that will for let him who wants to enjoy what did he do? let him do you want to enjoy life He says, let him who wants to enjoy and see good days. Good, whether apparent or not, it's still good. In the sense that even when you're in a worse situation, in the end, there will still be good. Some of God will make it work together. The Bible says, 
That man should keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from guile, treachery, and deceit. If you love to live a good life. Simply translated, I got tired of circumstances, those who bring them, and the situations that cause them. I got tired of a bad life. I can't stay. I can't speak anymore anyway. I can't. Now, have you heard me preaching? Someone can come after service and say, Apostle, pray for me. I have problems. Allow me to slap you today. Somebody just comes to the Apostle. Pray for me. I have problems. After hearing this message, You can't have problems. No. 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 Then God realizes, oh oh, this person has my mind. They think exactly like me. The word is established immediately. Because the two of you agree. Immediately, at the testimony of two or three, God witnesses the word that you've spoken and it reconciles with Rema and immediately, I mean with Logos, and that's it. Mark the words you speak even when you're joking. There's a person I've been dealing with lately. I've been telling this person, stop joking. I sit in. Somebody, you say, Ah, well, what can I give you? You know these days the poverty is in my bag. And I'm like, look at you. How can you confess that? Oh, I'm joking now, Apostle. Don't you joke. I told him, yeah, I don't joke that way. I don't, I don't joke that way. So somebody one time asked me, but what if it's the reality? Ask her, what is reality? Your reality is Christ. The Bible says, when Christ, which is your real life, that's your reality. That's your reality. That's your reality. When Christ, your real life, your real life, your real, your real life is who? But this is the reality, Apostle. I don't have money. Yeah, you have. How can you say that's the reality? One time I went to a conference somewhere. Let me finish with this and you get out of here. So, some guy, he said that he was a soldier, I think a US soldier, and he was leaving the United States and he was earning what? Uh, $10,000. And then because of the recession, Wall Street, you remember that story? So the guy's amounts go from 10000 and then they go to 3000 and then when they go to 3,000, he thinks he should come in Uganda and then invest some more money here. And so they invite him to come in that preaching engagement as a guy who knows God, who is a pastor, who was an army guy in the United States, but also knows God. So, well, they invited this guy and he started talking. I'm, I, I won't mention his name because I need to walk in love. So he stood on the pulpit and said, I used to earn $10,000. And now I earn... I went down to $3,000. And I realized that my expenses were high compared to the amount of money and the life that I was living. So I started to invest my money in a few things because I had to come to the reality that, listen, 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 that even if we are claiming that we are partakers of a divine nature, we are children of God, sometimes you have to face the reality. When your money reduces, I said, let's go. Please, let's go, please. How can they defile my spirit? In the first place, if your salary left 10,000 and went to 3,000, you're not supposed to be speaking. You're supposed to be learning. A 
And the man was teaching us how to live on small budgets. I didn't drive all that way for somebody to teach me to live under a small budget when I have the creator of heaven and earth, the author and the finisher of my faith, the cut on a thousand hills, he's the possessor of all things. Who, by the way, became poor. Of course, I'm sure. I'm sure now I'm living better than him. I'm sure. I'm not hoping. No. It's not even a statement of faith. I know. Stop killing yourself. Tell somebody, stop killing yourself. I don't care what you're going through. Put your head up high like you're the richest kid the world has ever. Walk with the confidence nobody can take away from you. If you are serious. The Bible says, if you are serious about this resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Act. If you're serious. If you're, unless you're joking. But if you're serious, you must first act the part. When you're alone in the room. When you are alone in the room. When you are alone in the room. Recently I asked myself, why is it that, I, I just remembered when we were young, I used to ask myself, where did this thing begin from? I thank God we used to have a jackfruit tree in my father's compound. And then these trees would fall. And then I would collect all these trees and get rubber band and tie them. Do I have a witness? And I put them in my pocket. And then I enter at home and I tell mommy and I tell I'm a rich man. I'm a rich man, baby. Don't talk with me. When I didn't have leaves, I used to get papers. Cut them the sizes of money. Tie them on rubber bands. Put them in the back of my pocket. And I used to walk like that. Are you hearing me? I've never thought poor. I've never. The day you wake up and you're so broke. Get trees. Get leaves of trees. Fold them a little bit. Are you hearing me? Put them in your pocket a little bit. Yeah. Start walking like that. And say, ah, ah. Somebody finds out and says, hey, brother, give me some money. Then you say, ah, these are leaves. No. Oh. He says, ah, it's going to do something else. Next time I'll give you. Somebody shout hallelujah. One time, I was somewhere, and I entered a shop, and there was this... There was watches, wrist watches. And then I picked a watch and I loved it. I looked at it like this. So this guy comes and looks at me with this. But he didn't know who he's talking to. So, it was very expensive. So I asked him, how much is this watch? The guy told me, $50,000. I kid you not, the, the watch was $50,000. I looked at him and said, no, that is not fair. This thing should be about 70. <laughs> I told the guy, this is not fair. It is too beautiful. This thing should be 70,000. I think I'll buy it at that amount. Of course, I didn't buy it that day. But in my head, I bought it. The man looked at me. He looked at me. He couldn't stop looking at me. He was like, my goodness, this guy, where is he from? People negotiate. For him, he wants to give more. Because the watch looks beautiful. It's called, act like it.
But some of you, you go to shops and then you look at a very nice stove. Then you like in the mirror like this. They say, how much is this? They say, a hundred thousand. Oh! Get to your feet, somebody. We are going to pray. Tell somebody we are going to speak Rema. <laughs> Listen to me. I want you to take three minutes and speak some of the craziest words you have ever heard yourself speak. Come on, one, two, three, go. Things are changing for you. Things are changing for you. Things are changing for you. You must believe it for yourself. against you but I decree and I declare you will never fail you will not fall in the hands of your enemy God will not hand you over to the will of them that hate you you are more than a conqueror in all these things 
by Christ to strengthen you. As these words enter your spirit every Thursday, every week of the day, you are the planting of the Lord. You cannot fail. You cannot fail. The Bible is very clear. As you continue to behold, like in a mirror, the glory of God, He says you are metamorphosed. You are changed from glory even to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Your life cannot remain the same again. You cannot fail. Things are coming through for you quicker. I decree and I declare that favor is springing up on you like it has never sprung up on you in the name of Jesus. The winds of the Spirit take you where you must be. In the right place and at the right time. I see the Lord quickening you than ever before. In the mighty name of Jesus. I see God do things in your life. Your family has never seen. Your relatives have never seen. Your friends have never seen. Uganda has never seen. Africa has never seen. The world has never seen. The Bible says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which you dare to ask or think according to the working power that works in you. I see that you're entering a grace beyond words you have ever spoken. Give me the amplified of that. He says now to him who by an inconsequence of the action of his power is able to carry out his purpose and do superabundantly far over above all that we dare ask or think. God is going to do infinitely beyond your highest prayers. Beyond, 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 beyond your highest prayers. Beyond your desires. Beyond your thoughts. Beyond your hopes. Beyond your dreams. Somebody say, I walk in a grace of which the Lord performs beyond my expectation, beyond my desires, beyond my dreams, beyond my thoughts, even above my highest prayers. Now, I have good news for you. If you have made a very dangerous statement when you are praying, God wants to do above that. Do you believe it? I believe it too. I told people we are going to shake this world. We are literally going to shake it. And it will be screaming our names. Mention your name. The world will be screaming Apostle Grace. You're deep. Praise God. 